Welcome to Premise Customers 83. And today we're looking at improving the aerodynamics of vehicles. So sports cars, and particularly sports utility vehicles. And these vehicles, they are quite blocky. So instead of being like a sedan or a um, convertible, these ones are like, you know, like the Jeep Wrangler kind of type looking. And so to look at this, we're going to look at a paper called Improvement of the Aerodynamic Behavior of a Sports Utility Vehicle Numerically by Using Some Modifications and Aerodynamic Devices. So modifications mean um, different things such as rounding corners or extending surfaces or making surfaces a bit more aggressive or less aggressive. And aerodynamic devices include, um, well, this particular case we're looking at a diffuser, but they include things in general such as vortex generators or just flaps or whatever, or even active flow control devices. And this is an open access paper, so you can find it in the link in the description. And it's quite a cool paper what they go into. So let's start. They say only a little research on how aerodynamics might improve the braking characteristics of passenger vehicles and its possibilities can be discovered in the literature. So that's actually a different angle that a lot of people look, don't, haven't looked at. So we, when we look at aerodynamics of vehicles, we all, almost always, at least for uh, production vehicles, we almost always look at the drag coefficient and sometimes the lift coefficient and stability um, coefficients. But the drag coefficient reduction is often what we're really trying to look at. That's what like probably 80% of the effort going into aerodynamics of vehicles goes into. So to think about uh, improving the braking characteristics of a passenger vehicle, that's pretty cool. Uh, they say most research yet has focused on high-performance vehicles like racing cars and high-end sports cars, making it difficult to determine how far this innovation can be transferred to passenger automobiles. So while some flow control devices and um, such as the fuser or whatever, they can reduce the drag. If you implement it wrongly, in a sense, they can increase the drag, which is actually good for braking purposes. They say that aerodynamic forces were frequently passed straight to the unsprung sections of the suspension in the past. And this was not good because it resulted in a lot of shocks to these joints and to the wings or whatever flow control device you had. And that resulted in a failure. This was in the past, back in the 1900s. When looking at photographs of cars from that era, one can see that the designers understated or underestimated the increase of the vehicle's performance when driving around a bend, leading to greater lateral pressures conveyed by the tires and also acting on the highly placed wings, which would out result in the wing dissociating from the car. So the wing becoming airborne. What's more is that back in 1900s and even earlier when, or maybe 1900s or so and late 1800s, they were looking at flow control devices for cars. Um, when there is so much um, of the, so many of these flow control devices and they are being pushed to the limit, when you just change something slightly, such as the angle attack, perhaps, or there's a bump in the road, that then changes the performance of these active flow control devices or passive flow control devices a lot. And then the and the automobile can lose control. So you can lose stability and then you just go crashing. That's why today in modern motorsport, there are very strict rules on uh, flow control devices that you can and cannot use. And also because to keep your competition competitive, because sometimes flow control devices um, to investigate use a lot of resources and not every team can afford to use these uh, resources. So that's another reason why. But let's bring it back to passenger vehicles because that's a massive market here. And we're looking at SUVs and station wagon cars. They have more air resistance than sedan models. One of the major reasons is because of the back. So if you look at a sedan vehicle, they are usually very tapered at the back, comparatively speaking. If you look at an SUV or a station wagon, it's just like a like you just cut off the back and it's just a, a flat plate. And the the um, cross-sectional area of the, of the back is pretty much the same as where the driver is. So it doesn't taper much at all. That's a massive problem because you have a massive area at the back, which is, ex which is um, experiencing a wake. And that means you have a very low pressure there. Upstream, at the front of the vehicle, you have all this air hitting the front and it's decelerating, which means there's a very high pressure there. So you have high pressure at the front, low pressure at the back. That's a recipe for a lot of pressure drag. And that's what happens. Sedan models, on the other hand, don't have that problem as much. That doesn't mean necessarily that they have better aerodynamics in terms of the drag coefficient, although they usually do. But because you reduce the area, just the drag drop so much. So you don't need to actually reduce the drag coefficient to reduce the drag. You can achieve this reduction in drag just by reducing the area that um, the reference area. But it is, also, it is also good to reduce the drag coefficient as well, which sedans usually do as well. So they say that um, 
due to the high rank angle of these SUVs and the airflow, the airflow separates early in such um, vehicles at the roof end. So in other words, because you cut it off as well, this results in the wake. This phenomenon can lead to the rise in drag, which is due to a high degree of turbulence behind the vehicle. So in other words, a wake. The rear screen and rear fairings are examples of passive aerodynamic devices. So um, also known as something like the backlight or the diffuser or how the, um, the car wraps around the back. All these areas dramatically affect how well the flow separates or stays attached. And we'll get into that a little bit later. The major aim of this present study is to reduce the drag coefficient and improve the stability of a Land Rover Discovery 4 on the road without affecting the capacity, comfort, and the main dimensions of the vehicle. Now, they looked into Renault's numbers between 7 million, 7 million 300,000 and 14 million 600,000. And many suggested modifications and aerodynamic devices are investigated. So I just have a picture here of the general Land Rover Discovery uh, 4. For those of you listening to this, it's very blocky. It looks almost like a big station wagon. And um, the back is just like quite flat. And there's no, not much of a taper there. So the vehicle model, the Discovery, is used in the present study as a benchmark for SUVs because the numerous aerodynamic references describe the cars with properties and overall aerodynamic behavior. So uh, in one way, that is a good reference or a good benchmark. In another way, SUVs are really changing these days. Um, they're getting a bit more tapered at the back. So if you look at the, I know that this is not really a, a typical SUV, but if you look at the Lamborghini SUVs or the Porsche SUVs, they are more tapered at the back. As I said, they're not typical like run-of-the-mill SUVs, but you can see that it is getting that way. It's starting to trickle down. The Land Rover Discovery has a drag option of 0 0.4, um, which is, I mean, it's, it's bad for a car, but it's not that bad considering the shape, if you think about it. It's considering how blocky it is, it's actually pretty decent compared to a sedan. Those sedans these days are around 0 0.25 to 0 0.3. Good ones are around 0 0.22. So having a drag option of 0 0.4 is horrendous, um, but that's the type of car it is. So anyway, let's move on to how they're investigating this. They're looking at CFD. And they're using a half computational domain with 13 million cells. Let's talk about this as well. So they're using something called a half domain, which means that instead of simulating the entire vehicle, they just cut it longitudinally down. So if you have the x-axis, which is the free stream direction, you cut it along that axis and you take either the left half or the right half. You then put a plane there and you call that a symmetry plane. And then whatever happens on one side is mimicked on the other side in the software. Is this good? For steady state, uh, it, first of all, two things. The steady state, it is pretty decent um, because you're averaging the entire uh, field. The other thing too is how accurate you want it. So if you want within a general ballpark of 5 or 10%, sure, you can use a half bit computational domain. If you want within 1%, then you need to really use a full domain. So it really depends on how accurate you want your simulations to be. So here they're using 13 million cells for a half computational domain. We'll talk about why they use 13 million in a minute. So they talk about their setup. They use realizable Kepson, standard K Omega, and SST K Omega turbulence models for their RANS simulations. So if you don't know what these are, I've covered them in other podcasts a little bit, but they are just different standards in terms of how to predict turbulence or model turbulence. Um, the By far the most accurate is the SST K Omega. Even for this situation, like one fallacy, which um, a lot of people do hang on to just because um, it is a relic from the early 2000s is that you can just use k omega or k epsilon for car aerodynamics but that is um, definitely not my experience or the experience of many other um, aerodynamics who have worked on cars uh, sst k omega is significantly better even even despite even having a fully turbulent flow sst k omega is still better so realizable k epsilon and standard k omega are okay if you have nothing else but if you can go for sst k omega this is a five equation model uh, which means that you're, you're modeling the turbulence um, based on more parameters. And that means it takes into account more aspects of the flow and you can predict um, more finer features, which is better. So let's talk about the validation of their CFD analysis. So the drag option of the Discovery 4 is measured experimentally in the Myra full-scale wind tunnel, which is, or it used to be a standard wind tunnel um, quite a few years ago, which... Um, the automotive industry really um, rallied around. The tunnel test section has a cross-sectional area of 34.9 meters squared. 
and the overall length of the Maira tunnel is only 15 meters. All experimental tests were achieved at a velocity of 100 kilometers per hour and zero yaw angle. So zero yaw angle means that the car is straight on. Now, obviously, um, when you were driving along, uh, depending on what speed you go, the yaw angle uh, will, will be different. So if the faster you go, the closer to zero yaw angle you will achieve because um, the crosswinds will no longer have as much of an effect. Whereas if you are traveling at 10 k's per hour and you have a crosswind of 20 k's per hour, you now have that vector sum summating and you have a very massive yaw angle. Alternatively, if you travel at 100 kilometers per hour and you have a cross, crosswind of 20 k's per hour, that's not going to be as great a summation and you're still going to have a quite uh, close to zero yaw angle going on there. Okay, so the drag coefficient is affected by the number of cells and that's the case with any CFD. We want to do a, what's called a um, mesh independent study. What this means is we want to increase the number of mesh cells we use in Navier-Stokes um, CFD solvers. The reason why I say this is because there are other solvers that you can use and we don't call them cells, but the same idea exists. In other words, you want to make the domain that you have as um, fine as possible to before um, before you um, don't use any more resources. So in other words, you want it to get to a certain point where if you go even further, the drag coefficient or the lift coefficient or whatever you're interested in, including the flow features, won't change. If you get to a point where, let's say you have 10 million cells and you increase the number of, million cells, number of cells to 20 million, and that changes the drag coefficient or the lift coefficient or whatever by a few percent, if you're not happy with that, then you need to refine the mesh further and go to 20 million and then do again. See, if I increase it to 40 million cells, what will the drag coefficient and the width coefficient and the flow features be like? And it's just that way. So what they did was that they looked from um, a certain number of cells up to 26 million cells of the whole domain and to see how that affected the, the results. They say that beyond 26 million cells, no consequential mesh dependency is noticeable, which means that that's when you get to the mesh independence. Now that's for the entire computational domain. And that's where we get the 13 million cells from. Remember how I mentioned that they're using a half domain and half of 26 million is 13 million cells. So this is the um, logic that they're carrying through. Table two shows the drag and lift coefficients obtained from numerical simulations of the benchmark model of the Land Rover Discovery 4. And they're compared to the experimental data. They said the numerical simulations provide great agreement with all experimental data. So let's have a look here. So they um, show the, the dimensions of the vehicles and then they go into the drag coefficient. The drag coefficient changes by about is 7% different in the numerical results compared to the experimental results. The lift coefficient is pretty close actually. It's 0 0.05 compared to 0 0.06 for the front wheels. The rear wheels is, 0, is minus 0 0.035 compared to minus 0 0.03. So they're both pretty close. Um, they could be closer, but it again depends on what how accurate you want your simulations to be. This is pretty decent for a um, good idea as to whether a flight control device would work or not. Now, I should mention the difference between front lift and rear lift. So the way that um, lift is measured in the wind tunnel for vehicles is that you have load cells under each of the four, well, it depends on the wind tunnel, but wind tunnels in general for automotive purposes, they have blow tools underneath each one of the four wheels. And you can then figure out how much lift the front of the car is producing, so the front wheels, and how much lift the rear wheels are producing. And this is important when it comes to stability. And also when you want to modify the car to reduce the lift overall, because by being able to break down the lift in this kind of situation, uh, you can figure out what modification is affecting the lift where. And then you can sort of exacerbate that and, or mitigate it if you don't like that. So let's talk about the modified models that they're looking at because we're trying to reduce the drag here. So redesigning the Land Rover Discovery 4 by modifying the upper and front regions is represented as the first modified model. All of these modifications are used to create a more streamlined geometry. The, placing a, the second uh, modification is placing a spare tire behind the vehicle as, fairing, as the fairing. And then finally, the third modification is creating a diffuser and modifying the Discovery 4. Sorry, the last, that's the third one. Sorry, the fourth one and the final one is actually performing all of them together. So let's look into these a little bit more. Modifying the exterior design. So in figure seven, they have the side view of the Land Rover Discovery. And what they did was they rounded some of the corners. And unfortunately, they don't um, go into all the different configurations that they, what they mean. So they have 
12 different configurations and each one of these configurations change the radius, rate the radii of the corners around the car to some extent. What that extent is or those extents are, we they're not uh, given here, but we can still look into this a little bit more. They say some modifications for the exterior design of the Discovery 4 are proposed while preserving the main car dimensions except the overall height. Now, the overall height is actually quite a big deal. If you lower the vehicle, that can change the lift dramatically and also the drag as well dramatically. Um, they say the main modification is in the upper part of the Discovery 4 to achieve a curved roof. Many different size, sizes are tested in order to achieve the optimal roof dimensions for the Discovery 4. Some of the sharp edges in front in the front of the Discovery 4 are changed to soft and curved. And figure 4 shows the different ones. So we have around the front bumper where the uh, bonnet or the hood meets the front windscreen and then where the windscreen meets the roof and then the roof itself. All these different um, cur all these different corners uh, curved a little bit to some extent. So all configurations of the modified exterior design of the Discovery 4 have the drag coefficient less than the benchmark model and acceptable lift coefficients, but higher than the benchmark model. So let's talk about these. So they have a table here with all the different configurations. Now they said the lift coefficient is higher. Why is that important? Well, for vehicles, typically we want to have as low lift coefficient as possible because if you have a high lift coefficient, like a positive one at least, it means that the vehicle, as you go faster, will start lifting up off the ground. When that happens, you have less load on the tires. Less load on the tires means less uh, normal force, which means less friction. Less friction means less control. And that's a big problem because you can actually spin out or, or crash or whatever. So you want to have as little lift as possible. And the problem with the cars is... Um, for how they're shaped they're all pretty much shaped in a very wing-like fashion and wings unfortunately or in this case unfortunately produce lift by having a flat underbody and a curved top it's effectively a cammed wing so we're getting lift coefficient all the time you can reduce the lift below zero with um, some interesting uh, designs or extreme modifications uh, but in this case for the land Rover discovery they're always well above zero they're like 1.3 or 1.4 so let's talk about the best situation here. So configuration nine in table three has a minimum drag coefficient of 0 0.361, which is much better than 0 0.4. Uh, and the most acceptable lift coefficient of 0 0.125. As a result, the optimal design of these modifications is number nine and the improved drag coefficient of 9.75 compared to the benchmark. So they said the most acceptable lift coefficient. So again, this depends on the stability. So there was a modification which had a lift coefficient less than 0 0.125 but the drag was a bit higher so it really depends on how much drag you want to reduce compared to how much lift you want to reduce so that's some of the um, difficulties that you run into when modifying a vehicle so that was those were the curves let's look at that's the first type of modification the second type of modification is putting the tire at the back of the like the spare tire on the back of the car so you know how you see all four drives and most of them have these tires at the back for um, like the spare one there. And this is quite an interesting one. I've never really thought about this, but it makes sense when we go into it, the results. So in addition to the exterior modifications, two aerodynamic devices are investigated for the modified Discovery 4. The use of a spare tire on the back door as a fairing to achieve a more streamlined model. The Discovery car with a spare tire on the back door has a better streamlined look than the benchmark and modified models because the spare tire covers a part of the wake zone behind this car. So what does this mean? So in layman's terms, it means that instead of having a full drive that is very flat at the back, you, you put something else on there. So it could, it could just be a beach ball for all you really care. It could be anything. <laughs> it's just to take up some of that space and make it more um, overall, gen a more gentle um, reduction in, in cross-sectional area instead of just being a complete stop and then the cross-sectional area is the same all the way through up until the passenger and the driver's side. Uh, by putting the tire there, it takes up some of that space and it means that the wake is not as big. So the figures eight and nine show the spare, the spare tire on the back door of the modified uh, car. And a spare tire is in place with the width of the middle of the back door, but the vertical positions are tested. So how high um, or low to the ground it is. Table four. Uh, shows the different configurations and the optimal position. So all of these cases of the spare tire position, regardless of how high or low off the ground it was, um, produced lower drag coefficients than the benchmark and redesigned models, but 
these cases have lift coefficients between the benchmark and redesigned models. So in other words, the tire was very good at reducing the drag, but because um, where it is, it makes the car even more wing-like, which is actually not good for the lift coefficient. And we can see these different um, results here. In fact, uh, they're all, they all give about the same drag coefficient. I mean, you could argue that going lower to the ground reduces the drag a little bit, but it's only one count, so one one thousand. And that's not much, particularly with CFD, that could be an error. Um, the lift coefficient is changed significantly more. So it's changed by about um, about 8%, 9% from best to worst scenario, whereas the drag coefficient changes by only a couple percent. So they say, in general, all configurations of the spare tire have downforce more than the redesigned models, uh, but not as much as the, the benchmark. The optimal position of the spare tire is accomplished by configuration four, as shown in table four. So this resulted in a reduction of 10.75% in the drag coefficient. How, and this is at a distance of 1.1 meters from the ground. So the minimum distance they, they tested was 1.07 meters. The maximum was 1.15. So it's in the middle there. So that's the second modification. The third modification to this discovery was the diffuser. So let's talk about diffusers a little bit before we get into it. So the diffuser, for those of you listening, are if you look at a car, any car, and you look at the back of it and uh, the underneath, that back underneath part is the diffuser area. So... Uh, I guess you could argue that every car has a diffuser. It just depends whether that diffuser is good or not. And the measure of a good diffuser is how well it reduces the wake size. So why does the diffuser reduce the wake size? That's a good question. The reason why is because usually the underbody of the car is pretty flat. You might have some opening, like some bits protruding out, but overall it's fairly flat. And if you have the air going underneath, and then it comes out of the back of the car, it's not really going to go up too much. It's going to stay fairly flat and close to the ground. So that means you have a really big wake behind the car. Now, if you put a diffuser on there, or you, so you angle the diffuser up a little bit, that means that the air coming underneath the car is going to hit the diffuser and travel along the car as the diffuser stay attached, and it's going to be redirected a little bit upwards. What that does is it reduces the wake size. A smaller wake results in a lower drag coefficient. Usually, I mean, if that's a good rule of thumb. You can have extreme situations where a smaller wake could still have a higher drag coefficient if it's more severe, but that's not generally the case with cars. Usually diffusers that um, have the flow attached still almost always um, reduce the drag. So that's how a diffuser works. Now, I mentioned the air staying attached. So why would the air um, detach or separate? The reason why is if you run the diffuser at too high an angle. So if instead of being at 10 degree angle, you might go to like 25 degrees. If you go to that such an extreme angle, the air may not have enough energy to stay attached to the diffuser and it will separate. And then the diffuser is actually um, often being like it's having negative effects on the drag coefficient. So that's how a diffuser works. So let's get into what this diffuser did to this car. So using a diffuser under the rear bumper is the other as another aerodynamic device proposed, and many different suggestions of the diffuser are suggest uh, given, as shown in Table Five. So they have um, the width of the diffuser, so how much of the back width it takes up, and also the height of it, so how far up the back of the car it goes. I'm, I'm not too familiar with that way of describing the diffuser. Usually, you give the width and then the the angle of um, the diffuser, but they're giving the height. So that's another way that you could just dimension it. They say that a diffuser works to guide airflow into the core of the wake and reducing the drag. The best drag coefficient and downforce are achieved when using the dimensions in configuration eight. And this results in a drag coefficient reduction of 10.25%. So configuration eight, uh, let's talk about this configuration. It has a height of 0 0.33 meters and a, a length of 0 0.9 meters. So in terms of the length, this diffuser doesn't cover the entire back of the car. Um, that's fairly strange. Usually the diffuser does cover the entire width of the car. Um, but in this case, they've, they've decided to test it in different configurations, which is good to know. They tested it from 0 0.8 meters to 1 meter. The height goes from 0 0.3 meters to 0 0.34 meters, so how tall the diffuser is effectively. Um, interestingly, the width of the diffuser 
does not necessarily mean, like the, a wider diffuser does not necessarily mean a lower drag coefficient they found in this particular case. In fact, for their best configuration, configuration eight, the diffuser was 0 0.9 meters in width, and that has a drag coefficient of 0 0.359. If you reduce the drag of the um, diffuser width to 0 0.8 meters, the drag coefficient increases by one count, so about um, two or three percent, about two percent. The if you increase the width of the diffuser by 0 0.1 meter to one meter in total, the drag coefficient also increases by uh, one count. So what does this mean? It means that there's a width to the diffuser, which is um, optimal in this situation. So why would that be the case? Well, um, often that, I, as I said, I haven't really seen too many studies looking at this width situation, but if we look at the diffuser's width and where it is in the car, um, it's right next to the rear wheels, just downstream of it. So if you extend the width over the, the diffuser over the entire width of the car, it means that the weight coming from the rear wheels will start to impact it. So is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? In this particular case, I think that it's a bad thing because as they went wider, I think the, the wakes of the wheel started to interfere with it. So there's a, and then if you went too small, then the diffuser is not as big. So it's not going to be as effective. So there seems to be this optimal range here. And why would the wakes of the wheels negatively affect the diffuser? One reason could be that the wakes of the wheels are wakes. They don't have a lot of energy, which means that if you put a diffuser behind it at the same angle of attack, so the, it's a, let's say you have an aggressive angle of attack, you need to have a flow with fairly like a fairly high amount of energy for the flow to stay attached around the diffuser. Now that's a problem for the wake coming around the rear wheels because this wake is not um, very highly energized, so which means that it could separate over the diffuser. So that may be one reason why having a wider diffuser in this situation was actually not such a great idea. Again, it's only one count, so it's not a huge amount, but um, it is something to think about. So let's look at the combined modification. So all of the add-ons together, because we looked at each one of them separately now. So we have the, um, the spare tire and the diffuser. Now, interestingly, they have, this is in figure 12, and they say combined optimal and modification so combined optimal modifications of aeronautic devices can reduce the drag coefficient, which leads to reduced fuel consumption. I should talk about here that just because you, so there's, there's two ways to, to interpret this. The first way is that combining each modification that has been optim, optimized individually um, does not necessarily mean that you get an optimal situation for this new configuration, which is all these optimal configurations together. Alternatively, what you should be doing is optimizing all of these configurations together because even though each one is optimized individually, they all interact with each other in terms of their flows. So the, the change in flow that the spare tire now is introducing can affect the flow over the diffuser and vice versa. So it's a good idea to look into each one of these um, individually and then put them together and look at each one of them, each, all of them together to optimize them um, and get a better idea that way. So figure 12 shows the, this discovery for after using all these modifications and add-on devices. The minimum drag coefficient now is 0 0.352, which is much less than the 0 0.4 that they started with. And this is achieved by combining the redesigned, so the um, like the um, rounded corners, the spare tire, and the diffuser configurations. These aerodynamic techniques reduce the drag coefficient by about 12%. The lift coefficient of this model is 0 0.037, which is in an acceptable range. So in figure 13, they have the relationship between the drag coefficient and the Reynolds number for the different configurations of the Discovery 4. Now, I wanted to talk about this because it gives us some insight as to how the diffuser works, and it um, gives a bit of credence to what I was saying earlier. So the drag coefficient for all of these um, models with and without these various add-on devices reduce as the Reynolds number increases. Now, interestingly, when you get to a certain Reynolds number, so about um, 10 million, these reductions start to plateau a little bit, but not the diffuser. The diffuser still uh, dives down pretty much just as sharply as it when it was at only 7 million, 7.3 million Reynolds number. So why is that? So the diffuser continues to reduce in um, drag as the Reynolds number increases when the others have plateaued because the diffuser, I think, is uh, too aggressively uh, angled or too aggressively styled 
so that the flow is now separating. So why I say that is because as you increase the angle of attack, the flow is more, uh, sorry, as you increase the remote level, the flow is more energy, which means it can stay attached over a more aggressive angle of attack of the diffuser. So I think that's what's happening here, where the other models uh, of the other add-ons, they're kind of plateauing because the additional energy that you're getting from the flow at high Reynolds numbers are not really, it's not really affecting the flow physics too much. So you're not really going to get a change in the drag coefficient that much. But for the diffuser, it is because the flow is staying more attached. So that I think is why also, um, again, having the wider diffuser was not as beneficial as having the medium sized diffuser because the weights of the tires were now interfer interfering with the diffuser and they didn't have enough energy to stay attached. That's what I think. And I think this graph, um, supports that as well now i don't know for ex exactly because they there's no other data on that um that diffuser here but it'll be interesting to see what the cfd would return so let's talk about the optimal design for the discovery four figure 14 shows the velocity profile around the benchmark and combined uh, modified discovery four models so this is really cool so figure 14 is the streamlines on the symmetry plane for two models of the discovery four, the benchmark and the modified model with diffuser and spare tire. The initial air velocity in these numerical simulations is similar to the experimental investigation, 20 meters per second, so 100 k's per hour. The airflow over the roof and underbody of the vehicles leads to generating of the generation of two vortices. Now, um, these are steady states, so these are the averages, and vehicles typically... Um, if you look at the transient nature, they have a von Karma streets as well as a lot of other transient features, and there will be different frequencies. So there will be other vortices present, but these are the two steady state vortices that are present. So you average out the entire flow and the transients goes, and you're left with these steady state vortices. The low pressure behind the benchmark, or the benchmark um, summary fall, is the main reason for making vortices in the non-uniform flow close to the rear bumper and the roof edge. While in the modified discovery four, these vortices are lower than the benchmark model because the spare tire covers some of the wake and the diffuser underbody is, directed, is directing air towards the core of the wake. The range of the air velocity over the benchmark model is between zero and 45 meters per second. So zero meters per second is <laughs> really bad. I mean, that means that the flow is coming to a complete stop. And that, that means that you're probably going to have a very low pressure as well because they're just so wakey. Um, but to be 45 meters per second, that's quite high considering the free stream velocity is only 28 meters per second. So there is some situation, uh, some flow there, which is accelerating and that's coming either from the diffuser or from over the top as well. But this is actually quite interesting because I was talking about this on YouTube with, uh, uh, one of our subscribers called James and about the diffuser and how the diffuser potentially can reduce the drag of a vehicle and also, um, by, by, uh, directing the flow underneath into the wake. And also if you have lift as well or downforce, you can use these angles that the flow is producing to um, reduce the wake size. And this is kind of what's happening here with the diffuser. So again, you're, if you have the diffuser at an angle, um, you can redirect the flow into the wake and make it a bit smaller. Also the tire itself, um, like the spare tire, seems to take up quite a bit of the wake and reduces the amount of area that these vortices can exist in. The wake size itself seems to extend the same length downstream, but it just squeezes, like pinches up a little bit. So that's in this podcast. Make sure to like, subscribe. And if you do CFD yourself, or you know someone who does CFD, or you do experimental um, investigations, make sure to check out the MSU Hawk. It's an instrument that we make to make your experiments 2 to 4% more accurate. Link in the description. And I'll see you in this podcast. Peace out, amigos.